Hey folks, this is Riker, and the Diablo 4 beta draws near. We got official news from Blizzard about an upcoming beta, complete with some key dates to pay attention to, and instructions on how you can opt in. In this video, we'll go through the blog post in which they make this announcement. But before we do that, we'll just quickly touch upon the major leaks that have been happening over the weekend and before. Now, this really did culminate in this past weekend with some gameplay footage leaking from the closed friends and family beta that's been happening for the past few months. All that footage is disappearing from YouTube, it's disappearing from wherever it could be disappeared from. Blizzard is issuing DMC takedowns, so we're not going to be showing any of that footage on this channel. It's in development footage, some of the stuff in there is placeholder assets, but suffice it to say that overall, what is being shown looks very promising. And soon enough, some of you folks will be able to play it yourselves and in addition, Blizzard announced after this closed beta that's coming up, early next year there will be a public beta so we'll all get to see everything. Now let's dive into this post, developer update, closed endgame beta draws near. So closed means it will not be made public, whoever's testing will not be allowed to talk about it. And endgame beta suggests it's going to be about the adventure mode like in D3 rather than the campaign so there's probably not going to be any story spoilers. So at the 2022 Xbox Games Showcase we foretold Lilith the Blessed Mother's return. As we march forward toward releasing D4 in 2023, still holding to that, we've reached a momentous milestone allowing community members to participate in testing early versions of the game and provide feedback. The feedback part is key here. Our closed endgame beta will be the first of a few opportunities, a few opportunities, first of a few, for select players to experience some of what D4 has to offer. Players will be invited to test D4's robust endgame offerings using specific gameplay data. Additional details explaining what types of players are being invited and how invites will be sent out are communicated later in this blog. This closed beta will be confidential, meaning players invited will be unable to publicly talk about or share their gameplay experience. Additionally, the closed endgame beta will be playable on PC and Xbox Series XS, Xbox One, PS5, and PS4. Cross play and cross progress for all platforms will also be supported. That is huge and possibly a first for Blizzard. Most betas for Blizzard tend to be on PC. Now we're going to have full crossplay between all systems. For a quick look at what's to come, check out this video from game director Joe Shelley and franchise GM Rod Ferguson. Let's have a listen. Hello everyone, I'm Rod Ferguson and I'm Joe Shelley. Now as Diablo 4 marches towards its launch next year, we're excited to announce that we'll soon be entering a new testing phase. A new end testing game closed phase beta focused on everything that happens phases. after you finish the epic campaign. Since it's a closed beta, we'll be directly inviting a large number of people using gameplay data to find players who have recently spent significant large time in Diablo endgame experiences. These players will give selection. us feedback on endgame features like PvP, Nightmare Dungeons, Whispers of the Dead, and our newest feature, Helltide. To be eligible to receive our invite, make sure you check out our latest blog for instructions. This is the blog, we'll go through the and instructions. And don't worry, if you're not invited, public testing phases will come early next year. Phases, plural. Now, participants in the endgame beta will be under NDA, so they won't be able to discuss it publicly. But this feedback is critical to ensuring Sanctuary is an exciting place to slay demons long after the campaign is over. And on behalf of the Diablo 4 team, I want to say thanks for your support and we'll have even more news to share later this year, so stay tuned. And in the meantime, hail Lilith. So this is mother. not replacing the quarterly update blog. It sounds like there still will be one of those. That'll probably be the more news to share later this year. The other interesting thing here is that this is very different from the Diablo 3 beta, which was a very limited beta. You can only play up to, I believe, level 9 or 15. Regardless, you can only play up to the Skeleton King in Act 1. There was very little of the game that you could experience. It didn't really seem like they were looking for feedback on changing the game. It seemed more more like a marketing beta, if anything, or maybe they were bug testing the initial experience. Uh, they really didn't show us enough of the game to really give feedback on anything that they could act upon. This is starkly different. They are actively soliciting feedback on the endgame systems. And that's what they're explaining here. They're also saying the full story of Lilith's Return to Sanctuary is not something we would like to spoil prior to release. 
players will experience a post-campaign sanctuary. Also, for many, the endgame is their favorite aspect of Diablo. We want to ensure it feels satisfying, and with no shortage of challenging variety to experience across many, many Demon Slaying gaming sessions. This has been the big thing that I've been wondering about for the... For a quarterly update, I want to know what are we going to do in our day-to-day -day in Diablo 4. Once we're done the story, what is it going to be to play Diablo 4, you know, for a couple hours every day? What will you be doing? And it sounds like this is the answer to that. To achieve this, we're collecting community feedback early so that it may be integrated into D4 prior to launch. Players who are selected will have the ability to provide feedback between bouts of cutting down demons through an in-game feedback tool. Now here's a rundown on the offerings of the closed endgame beta. Helltide, Nightmare Dungeons, Whispers of the Dead, Fields of Hatred, and Paragon Boards. Take stock of the skills and knowledge you cultivate from playing through these features. You'll need every tool at your disposal to defeat the closed endgame beta's boss. A boss at the end of the closed endgame beta that will not be the story boss. So that's interesting. Is it going to be some kind of a rift guardian? Is it going to be a world boss? Let's dive into what these features are here. So, Helltide. While roaming sanctuary on foot or atop your trusty steed, be aware of your surroundings, for you might find yourself caught in a Helltide. This is a new region-wide event that becomes available to your heroes only once they have reached World Tier 3 Nightmare difficulty. So here's an indication of difficulty. People have been wondering, is it going to be normal Nightmare Hell? Is it going to be like Diablo 3 with Inferno 1, 2, 3? World Tier 3 Nightmare difficulty. This seems to suggest that there are at least three, if not more. This is probably going to be higher. After Nightmare comes Hell, of course. So, World Tier 1, probably normal difficulty. World Tier 2, maybe hard difficulty. Then we go to Nightmare. World Tier 4 might be Hell. If there's even more, then maybe it goes into Torment. Who knows? But the fact that they call it World Tier, and again, this is an open world game. It suggests this will be a global modifier of the difficulty on the entire world. Alright, in a Helltide. The servants of Lilith are empowered, having their difficulty increased, but dropping loot worthy of the danger. More loot, more risk, more reward. Her mightiest minions are also out in greater force, so greater monster density perhaps. And the very ground of Sanctuary as you know it has been morphed by the surge of demonic activity. This suggests there will be some physical, uh, visible effect so that you know you are in a Helltide. Now, it says region-wide. When they say region, are they talking about the North American region? the European region, or are they talking more in-game regions like Skosglen, or perhaps even smaller regions? That's not clear. The fact that they say you might find yourself caught in a Helltide suggests it's probably not across all of North America, which would mean wherever in your game you go, you're caught in it. Given there's a chance, it seems like it might be some zone within the game world where you might visit that will be a Helltide, and you'll know it's a Helltide because you're going to see it's all morphed in some demonic way. As you call the monstrosities inhabiting a Helltide, they'll potentially drop Cinders, a new currency that can be spent to open Helltide chests scattered throughout the respective region. So again, this further suggests it's going to be some region within the game world. There are five countries, if you want. Skosglen, Hawazar, the Fractured Peaks, Kejistan and Hawazar. Those are the five. I don't know if that, again, is a full region or if it'll be zones within those big regions. Helltide chests scattered around. These chests boast bountiful boons exclusive to a singular item slot, such as torso legs or two-handed weapon. But be wary in hoarding your cinders. Should you fall in battle, they'll drop and must be reclaimed. So, extra penalty for dying here. You will drop your cinders. So... Sort of a soft, hardcore mode, if you will. I know some players were looking for a greater death penalty than D3 has to offer in regular softcore mode. Now, these chests boast boons exclusive to a singular item slot. So, I guess you can go around and look for the chest that you are interested in. Let's say you have bad pants. That's your weakest itemization slot, so maybe you're going to look for better legs. Or maybe you're specifically hunting for a unique two-handed weapon, so you'll go for that. It seems to suggest that you open that chest and that's all or mostly what will drop 
from those chests. Now onto the Nightmare Dungeons. We've heard about these. We've crafted a difficulty of Diablo Dungeons straight out of your nightmares. No, really. Nightmare difficulty dungeons in D4 unlock upon locating your first Nightmare Sigil. So I believe these used to be called Key Dungeons in when we were first introduced to them in 2019. I think you needed like a key for the dungeon. So it sounds like the Nightmare Sigil is the key you need to open a Nightmare Dungeon. We know the game has something like 150 different dungeons that are likely situated throughout the world. They probably have some base difficulty, but then if you find a Nightmare Sigil, then you can somehow empower a dungeon to turn it into a Nightmare Dungeon. Each Sigil corresponds to a specific dungeon somewhere within Sanctuary. So those dungeons are there, you can visit them normally, unless maybe after the campaign you cannot, then the only way to get in is with a Nightmare Sigil. But these Sigils will add special modifiers to their dungeon, increasing the ferocity of the Hell Serpents waiting for you inside and providing higher rarity loot. So this is very, very, very common now in ARPGs, be it Path of Exile, be it Last Epoch, modern ARPGs now have ways for you to empower your dungeons, your maps, whatever you want to call them, to increase the difficulty and the reward. Through completing Nightmare Dungeons, you will recover even more powerful sigils, introducing increasingly death-defying modifications and challenges for you to overcome. As you progress into higher and more challenging world tiers, new Nightmare Dungeons will become available for you to explore. So one interpretation of this could be that, let's say there are 150 different dungeons. Maybe 10 of those are at the base difficulty, the base Nightmare Sigil difficulty. Maybe then another 10 will be at a second tier, another 10 at another tier. Maybe there's 15 tiers in total, and the only way to unlock the, the tier 15 set dungeons, or sorry, nightmare dungeons, will be to unlock the highest world tier difficulty. In this way, it's going to be something similar, or in this way, in this interpretation, it will be something similar to Path of Exile's mapping system, where you have to find maps, the map will open a portal to a dungeon, a map, and you can further empower those maps in ways to make them more difficult, and there are, let's say, 15 tiers of difficulty of maps, uh, going increasingly more difficult. It does sound here like there are two things at play, that as you progress into higher world tiers, new Nightmare Dungeons become available, and you also have the more powerful sigils. So it could be that for a singular dungeon, you could perhaps run that same dungeon on increasingly powerful sigils. But then separately, you can also unlock increasingly difficult Nightmare Dungeons, at higher world tiers. On to Whispers of the Dead. The Tree of Whispers has a few loose ends to tie and needs your help settling the score. Displayed on your map, players will see various Whispers scattered throughout Sanctuary. Sounds like bounties. Complete the associated task and be met with experience, gold, and grim favors. The number of grim favors you receive from completing a Whisper varies, but once you've collected 10 grim favors from the dearly departed, they can be exchanged at the Tree of Whispers for a bevy of loot and experience to reward your heroics. So you have bounties to do. Let's say you do 10 bounties and then you can turn in for a reward. But some bounties are more challenging, so they might count as two bounties or more for argument's sake. The types of whispers a player sees on their map rotate frequently with new ones becoming available throughout the day for you to track. Each whisper will offer both a different set of rewards and experience for completing it. So, okay, the bounties or whispers themselves provide rewards, and then once you've collected 10 favors, you can turn in for an additional super reward. So you will see these whispers rotate frequently throughout your map. New ones become available throughout the day for you to track. Each has a different set of rewards. It's possible you might know what the reward is before going for a Whisper, which might encourage you to go for some Whispers over others. Otherwise, the default is just go for the easiest ones, right? Go for the ones that are the most convenient, the easiest to access. Traditionally, the Whispers of the Dead system does not become available to players until after completing a specific chapter of the main quest line. For the closed beta, players will be able to engage with the system right out of the gate. All right, now... Bounties in Diablo 3 are an activity that very few players enjoy doing. Bounties in Diablo Immortal are more palatable in a way, simply because you can't do more than 8 per day. So there's a finite limit to how many you can do, and doing your 8 bounties isn't a huge inconvenience. 
In Diablo 3, there's no limit to how many bounties you can do, so you can literally spend eight hours farming bounties until you hate yourself. And there's a specific resource in Diablo 3 bounties that you can only get from bounties, or very rarely outside of bounties, but in a very limited capacity to the point that the only real way to get those materials is by doing bounties. Now, the downside of a mortal system is the FOMO, the fear of missing out. Not all players enjoy feeling compelled like, oh, I have to log in every day in order to do XYZ because if I don't, then I fall behind. Diablo Mortal has a system whereby you can stack up to three missed days before you start falling behind. It's unclear whether there will be that FOMO aspect somehow built into this Whisper of the Dead system. However, so far, it doesn't sound like they're saying that whatever you're getting from this bevy of loot and experience, it doesn't sound like there's any rewards unique to these Grim Favors or these Whispers of the Dead. So imagine if in Diablo 3, you were limited to eight bounties per day. If you missed a day, then those are bounty materials of one day that you can never catch up on. Let's say you have two people, they're both playing one hour every day and one person misses a day, then that other player can't spend two hours the next day to make up for it. You just literally can never get those materials. However, if there's nothing exclusive to the Whispers of the Dead, and you can just put in extra hours farming elsewhere within the game to catch up or to make up for those lost items or lost loot or XP, then I think the FOMO won't be so bad. Alright, onto the Fields of Hatred. Born from their contempt of mortals, Mephisto has cursed specific areas of Sanctuary, transforming them into deadly fields of hatred. Now, okay, here they're saying specific areas, whereas up here, they said region-wide. These designated PvP zones, again, a different word, are the proving grounds for players looking to bring renown to their name through blood and zeal. While inside the Fields of Hatred, players can dispatch demons to collect Seeds of Hatred. To make use of these seeds, you'll need to bring them to the Altar of Extraction where they can be smashed into red dust. Be quick to convert your Seeds of Hatred to red dust, they are the desire of other players lurking in the zone, and if they are skilled enough to overtake you in combat, your Seeds of Hatred will be dropped. Going through the trouble of transforming Seeds of Hatred into red dust does have its merits. Red dust will not be lost if you are felled. It can also be spent at the PvP cosmetic and mount vendors for ornamental rewards. Will you be able to forge a name for yourself in these tainted lands? So, specific PvP zones. If you don't want to get PvP'd, stay out of that zone. When players die, they drop Seeds of Hatred. You can pick those up. You have to then turn them in. Then it becomes bound to you. But if you have not yet bound it to you, then someone could kill you and take all the seeds you have collected. Or, in theory, the two top dogs could kill each other, all the seeds drop on the floor, and then a little noob runs in and scoops them all up. I do like the fact that there is some form of objective within the PvP zone beyond just kill other players. It adds a more interesting strategic dynamic to things. It adds for some more potential interesting play. Now this isn't my personal preferred form of PvP, I prefer more structured uh, PvP arena type things. I do hope that the PvP won't end up being DOA the way Diablo 3's PvP was DOA, but at least they are testing it, they will be collecting feedback about it, and hopefully uh, it will be able to create a thriving PvP scene, or otherwise I hope the devs are open to potentially adding more PvP stuff in the future, even instanced PvP events similar to in Diablo Mortal, just perhaps gear equalized so it's an even playing field, even similar to Lost Ark's PvP, for instance. It's also nice to see here that the rewards in the PvP zones are cosmetic. So there's probably going to be exclusive PvP cosmetics, but players who don't like PvP won't feel obliged to PvP in order to get some kind of exclusive form of power or crafting material or something that they need to play the game. Whereas the PvP guys get to wear those sick PvP cosmetics and show off that they're bosses. And yes, I know some players who hate PvP will see those skins and feel incentivized or even obligated to PvP in order to get those skins, but you gotta give some reward for PvP, and this seems to be the fairest outcome. Alright, Paragon Boards. Upon reaching level 50, the Paragon Boards, an endgame character growth system designed to empower your hero, unlocks. And again, from past screenshots, we've seen that it seems as though level 100 is the max level, so there is a finite end to Paragon. As your hero earns experience, they will receive Paragon Points. 
These points can be spent to unlock new tiles, sockets, and even additional Paragon boards to further customize your hero and ascend to new heights of power. For more in-depth look at the Paragon board system, check out our uh, 2021 December D4 quarterly update. We got a video on that over here. Be sure to check that one out. All right, who will be invited? Here we go. Ensuring that D4's endgame provides the type of thrilling, ever-evolving experience we have set out to create is paramount for the team, and something we cannot determine on our own. We need experts, perhaps even players such as yourself. Specifically, we'll be using gameplay data to invite a limited number of Diablo players who have recently spent significant amounts of time playing the endgame experiences of D2R and D3. And now I just hit refresh, and now we have Diablo Immortal. It was noteworthy that Immortal was missing, and now Immortal is there. If you believe you fit the requirements to be one of the selected players, you can help ensure our invitation to the closed endgame beta reaches you by following the steps below. So before we get into the steps here, this means you're not submitting an application and pleading your case. They're going to look at your Battle.net account. They're going to be able to see how many hours you have logged in these games over the course of recently. So maybe the past couple of seasons. Does this mean they are looking exclusively at people who have done a GR 150 in Diablo 3? I don't believe that's the case. I think it's more about the time invested in end game. They want to ensure the end game of D4 is going to be robust and it's going to make happy the people who are already playing these end game systems. And so they're not going to just shotgun spray beta keys to anyone with a Battle.net account and give it to someone who's never even played Diablo and so doesn't have insight into what the end game is or possibly doesn't even like ERPG end game at all. So the steps to follow to ensure you are opted in. Visit the Battle.net website or the Battle.net launcher. Click your username that's displayed in the top right hand corner of the screen. Click account settings or view account, depending on the platform. Click the privacy and communications menu. Click the privacy and communication menu option, then scroll down to communication preferences. Click the update button and make sure the news and special offers from battle.net option is enabled. So we'll do this live now on my battle.net account. Got my battle.net launcher open here. Click the username, click view account, that takes you to the website. On the left, you click Privacy and Communication. You scroll down to Communication Preferences. And you want to make sure that this here, News and Special Offers from Battle.net, is enabled. If it's not, you hit Update, you check the box, and you hit Save. Now, it's important that you have to have opted in by October 11th. Now, if you are selected to participate in the beta, you'll receive an email invite from noreply at e.blizzard.com with further instructions. If it is not from this URL, and then it is being sent from the King of Nigeria, do not trust it. Do not send 200 euros to a Telegram account to unlock your beta access. If you have not received an email invite to the D4 closed beta by November 18th, then you have not been selected to participate. But don't fret, public testing phases will begin early next year. So those are our key dates, folks. October 11th is the deadline to opt into the beta. And then it sounds like there will be waves going out and the final wave will be November 18th or sooner. So no further waves for this specific beta will go out after November 18th. If we had to guess, the testing will likely run until the holiday season. As for when beta starts, it could be as early as tomorrow, honestly. I don't think it would be tomorrow, but I don't think it's going to have to wait until October 11th. This is just the end of the opt-in period. By the 11th, they'll have selected everyone or they will have gotten their pool and then they will roll out the beta waves, which is what they tend to do. They tend to not give out all beta invites on one day, but perhaps a few every week. On a personal note, I would say do make sure to check your spam filters just in case you never know. And then again, public testing phases, plural, will begin early next year. It's unclear whether public means open beta or whether it simply means again invite only beta but people can stream it people can make video content about it so rest assured that when this comes i will be covering this stuff whether i am in the beta or not we'll still be able to look at the footage and discuss it together so again do go make sure you are opted in because that's going to wrap up this video folks also quick note if you have not played a whole lot 
it's unclear. Maybe you have until October 11th to log a bunch of hours in D2R and D3. Maybe you can still blast the heck out of these games before the October 11th deadline. You never know. It can't hurt. But that's going to wrap up this video. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you saw on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon and unlocking behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. Check out these other videos and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.